One of the experiences I trust every homebrewer shares is the feeling of awe that comes from witnessing the conversion of wort into beer through the fermentation process. Even after 15 years, I still get giddy when I see the first signs of airlock activity, a nice fluffy croissant developing on top of my beer. The worst is when this takes too long. You all know the anxiety that comes from checking on a batch a day after pitching and seeing no action. This is why we love Imperial Yeast, who pack 200 billion cells of the purest yeast into each pitch right pouch, which assures quick starts, healthy fermentation, and predictably great results. I strongly urge all of our listeners to check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and let them know that you appreciate their support of the Brewlosophy podcast while you're at it. All right, on to the show. In this day and age, hops are pretty much the star of the show when it comes to beer, due in large part to the massive popularity of IPA, of course, which is known to receive hefty post-boil hop additions. However, brewers still tend to employ kettle hopping when making most beer styles, and the initial dose made at the start of the boil is often referred to as the bittering addition. You're listening to The Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Andy Carter to chat about what happens when the initial bittering hop addition is removed halfway through the boil step. I know this sounds like an odd experiment, but we were so interested in those came about in the philosophy group chat about what really is solubility, right? Does the green matter, the hop matter that you see when you open a bag of hops up and smell them and put them in the kettle, does all that stuff just end up in the boil and it's just processing the chemical, like the chemistry, you know, the bittering and everything, or is it really bound to the hop itself? So I think this is a really fascinating experiment. I can't wait to talk about it. Yeah. One of our goals since we started the whole experiment series has been to test variables that are applicable to the common brewer. And this one, I guess I'm just not sure if that really meets the same standard, but I mean, you, when you think about it, how many people are actually removing hops from wort before the boil is complete? My hunch is it's not very many, but that said, this is one of those variables, like you mentioned, Andy, that can help us better understand the nature of kettle hop additions, solubility, stuff like that. Uh, And that is why we took it on. So I'm looking forward to chatting about it as well. If you're a fan of this show and you'd like to receive a reward for your support, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Our guest for this month, March of 2023, is the dude behind the the awesome YouTube channel, The Brew Show, Trent Musho, with videos covering everything from brewing methods like brew in a bag to making unique non-beer recipes like hop water. Trent is a well-regarded uh, home brewer for his content that's equally as informational as it is uh, entertaining. Trent's going to be hanging out with patrons on Saturday, March 25th, 2023, so you got to make sure to make that pledge of just $3 or more per month uh, over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy no later than Friday the 24th. And just a heads up, uh, with the... the Yakima Valley Hops reward for this month is $6 off one pound of hops, uh, a very specific hop that that patrons will know about, but six bucks off for a $5 per month pledge. I mean, that's a deal that writes itself. So all past sessions are available on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Learn more about becoming a patron and check out all of the rewards we offer for your support over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really would appreciate it. Last I checked, we were nearing 980 reviews in Apple Podcasts, which is so close to the 1000 mark that we, for whatever reason, would love to hit. Uh, There's really no benefit to doing that. I think it just makes us feel good, milestones and all. Uh, And huge cheers to everybody who's already taken the time uh, to do that for us. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who in addition to having a rad YouTube channel chock full of great brewing related content, sell what we believe to be some of the best electric brewing systems on the market. If you've been considering making the move from propane to electric, you owe it to yourself to check out Clawhammer Supply. Whether you're after a 120 volt 5 gallon unit or something bigger like their powerful 240 volt 10 gallon system, Clawhammer has got you covered. Learn more about everything they have to offer over at clawhammersupply.com and don't forget to check out their YouTube channel as well. Listener William Babcock from New Jersey wrote in with some uh, some general feedback, we'll call it. He said, uh, what is up, my home slice home brewers? I just have to give mad props to y'all. I've casually viewed your website, but started listening to the podcast a month or so ago, starting at numero uno, of course, and have been crushing all the episodes when I can. I've been brewing for a while now, but the one thing I always had issues with was hitting my OG, and I had no idea why. I've been fortunate enough to be able to afford multiple iterations and combinations of brewing equipment, 
Finally setting, uh, settling on the SS Brutech grain mill, the Grainfather G40, that's a killer unit, and the Grainfather Glycol Chiller with three of their GF30 conical fermenters. Even with all of this rad equipment, my numbers were not on point. WTF. I almost gave up on the hobby. After listening to multiple episodes, I finally it finally clicked and I bought a grain bag from the brew bag. Uh, they have one specially made for, uh, for the Grainfather G40. After my first brew, I knew I was in love and not that creepy one date and I own you kind of love. I adjusted my recipes to accommodate the whole BIAB thing and by golly, not only did I hit my OG, I was two points over. What the fish? Uh, it was it was. A fluke. No, nope. Five subsequent batches all proved to be the same on or above my intended OG. You cannot imagine my elation. I was finally excited to be brewing instead of anxious that my numbers uh, would be off yet again. I have to thank the whole Motley Brew crew at Brewlosophy for all of the big pimping of BIAB. Cheers and much love from the unfairly maligned state of New Jersey. <laughs> You know, this is, is so great to hear because what I hope I impart, I hope what we impart when we do brewlosophy is the the, the um, mentality or at least some a version of it. You know, we don't want to give advice or, you know, force a way of doing something on people. But, you know, the idea that uh, just trying things is worth it, right? Yeah. Just trying how to new, something new is worth the uh, the journey is worth the uh, the end. Right. And so how he was or how they were saying, hey, you know, let's find out why this is wrong not to, to say that uh you know hitting your ogs is like the most important thing in the world i think that's one thing we say all the time that's not <laughs> the point right yeah. knowing your system is more important uh but having him having them say hey you know, this is something i want to work on and then finding the solution through us just through experimentation i think that's just so rad yeah i i do too uh william it's really nice to hear that kind of stuff really uh, you know, we don't get too many lauding emails. Usually it's complaints or pointing out that we did something yeah. wrong or said something <laughs> wrong. We try, we try to address that stuff. So it really is nice to hear that something that we're doing, you know, or the stuff that we talk about is actually helping people out. And yeah, man, I couldn't agree more about how rad BIAB is. And I was one of those weirdos who sort of wrote it off when I first heard about it. I think a lot of home brewers did, uh, at least for us small scale brewers, though, it's such a convenient method that doesn't seem to have much, if any negative impact on beer quality. And the fact that you're getting consistently better efficiency is pretty rad. Uh, William, I wanted to let you know, I got your other email as well, talking about your husband and their love of uh, cider, I believe. So I believe you might've made uh, one of our cider recipes. So hopefully you both are enjoying that as well. Thank you so much for writing in William. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. I'm sure some of you listening to this show right now, consider yourselves for whatever reason, uh, you know, not YouTube people. I totally get it. I'm not one who really enjoys spending time with my nose and my phone, but I still appreciate good content when it's there. If you do as well, please at least take a minute to check out our new YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show. Host Martin Keen, formerly of The Homebrew Challenge, has put a lot of work into creating a fun channel with videos focused on myriad interesting topics from brewing beer recipes designed by artificial intelligence to eating dry yeast as a way to stave off getting drunk. Uh, he revisited that whole experiment that I did about t almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it is really good stuff. We're having a lot of fun and it seems like the people who are viewing the videos really do enjoy it as well. Kind of a, a breath of fresh air in the brew tube world. Uh, you can find our channel at youtube.com slash at the brewlosophy show. That's the at symbol followed by the brewlosophy show. Or you can just search for brewlosophy on YouTube. If you like it, don't forget to subscribe so you know when new episodes drop. All right. When we're back from this break, our focus will be on removing bittering hops mid boil. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. 
As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. There's a lot about brewing that's just accepted as a matter of course. We just do it because we were taught to do it. It works, so we don't really question it or change anything. This is certainly the case for me when it comes to kettle hopping or adding hops to boiling wort. Uh, before we get too deep into this arguably esoteric, <laughs> odd topic of removing <laughs> you know, hops from the boil, perhaps we should go over some hop fundamentals first. Yeah, if it wasn't esoteric, we wouldn't talk about it. That's right. So yeah, let's, right. So let's, let's, so, okay, so hops, I think we're all... If you're brew, if you tried brewing at all, you understand the hop, or you've had craft beer. You know, hops are, if now more than ever, so important to craft beer. But this specific part of it, the, the bittering, why hops are in beer, you know, essentially in beer is, is important. So what's inside of a hop? It looks like a little leaf, and you cut it open. There's these glands, these little yellow, golden little pellets or pills. They're called lupulin, and this is the stuff we want. <clears throat> it's the good stuff. What we say is, so this is what has all of the flavor in aroma and in this case bitterness that the hop holds and it's not bitterness so much that it starts as bitterness it needs to be processed and that's what the boil does so these are oils and terpenes so i think there's um we weren't going to get into the full chemistry neither marshall nor me or are, 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 are hop chemists but <laughs> what we'll say is we know that it's in the hop and that's why we add the hops whole or pellets or what have you in the beer nowadays there's many different types of non-traditional uh, process products but you know hops themselves go into the boil yeah and and like you i, I mean I, I would you agree with me andy that we know just enough to be dangerous about the way <laughs> about hops and what I, they I, do I, I, exactly <laughs> and i think that's enough i think that's something that's important is that i'm an engineer by trade and i don't know exactly how a lot of things happen in my field right because i'm not a <laughs> chemist i'm not a I'm, I, I am a, i would consider myself a physicist in some regard but i'm an engineer right yeah. i have a goal in mind i need to get to that goal regardless of what's underneath it, right? The underpinnings, the science is not what I'm here for. Not necessarily what I'm here for every day, right? I'm here for making something and that's what we want to make. We're wanting to make beer, right? We're making good good to great tasting beer. So. Exactly, exactly. So when we look at hops, we know there's lupulin in there and that, loop, that lupulin is what contains all of the good stuff that brewers are after, right? And that includes, like you mentioned, Andy, that's the oils and the terpenes. That's where you're getting all that aroma and flavor. That's the big focus these days with, uh, you know, IPA styled hops or New World hops, and, and a lot of the newer American hops uh, are very high in oils and and uh, very specific terpenes that are going to impart these fruity characteristics. But another thing that is contained in the lupulin are these acids, uh, namely beta and alpha acids. Now we're not going to focus too much on beta acids. Uh, but just to get it out there, these are insoluble in wort uh, and only contribute bitterness when they've been oxidized. Now, that's an issue. If you if you are a brewer, you know that oxidized hops are not a good thing. Uh, so these beta acids don't get isomerized during the boil, meaning that they, they don't, there's no iso beta acids, if you will. Uh, what they'll do, though, is if they're oxidized and you and so you're brewing basically with old oxidized hops. Uh, and you're, it, it will impart a bitterness, but it, is, it tends to be a bit more harsh and unpleasant uh, than alpha acid bitterness, than iso alpha acid. So just keep that in mind. What we're focusing on primarily, though, are alpha acids. And in hops or in lupulin that comes from hops, there are three main types of alpha acids. Those are humulone, adhumulone, adhumulone and one that you hear about all the time is cohumulone. We're not going to break those down too deep, uh, but alpha acids do isomerize, and that isomerization is a function of of both heat and time, or at least that's what we're told, meaning that uh, the longer those hops are in boiling wort, the more isomerization occurs, and thus the more bitter the beer will become. Yeah, so isomerization is a process in chem chemistry, and I think this is one important part of chemistry to understand is that you have a chemical compound, right? A compound is a set of elements, right? C, 
O, H, you know, the, those strings of chemistry. And this gets into what's called organic chemistry or the chemistry of carbon-based materials, right? Everything we interact with in life is carbon-based more or less. Yeah. Non-carbon-based materials, that's a different story. But carbon is such a fundamental element because it has its number of chemical bonds it can make. It, it, is, it, it likes to bond with things that are relatively, relatively available on the planet, that kind of stuff. So it's organic chemistry. What happens in isomerization is the same number and type of element stays the same, but the structure changes. Structure is so important. Honestly, in my mind, engineering mind, structure of a chemical compound is actually more important than the chemical composition itself because structure is how it interacts with everything else around it. And that is that is really chemistry when it, you know, interactions between compounds is really chemistry. So yeah, yeah, uh, that's what we call iso alpha acids. So we're not, again, we're not going to get into the two in the weeds there, but just remember that there's, there's different types of alpha acids. They respond differently, and some people believe they attribute different types of bitterness. And it's important is that we're looking at bitterness in this experiment, but bitterness is a whole l- larger category of astringency and other ways bitterness can hop, ha, end up in the beer through yeast, through all these other ingredients, but just hot bitterness because it's like the oldest way of providing a structured mouthfeel that is that complements the sweetness of wort and the fruitiness of yeast, bitterness comes in this way. So Yeah, yeah, no, good points there. And I, I again, just to kind of reiterate, I think this can get kind of confusing. Alpha acids are alpha acids. You've got those three that we talked about, but those on their own, if you eat a hop pellet or a hop cone, it's going to be bitter as hell. I mean, that, it, that's the case if you eat a lot of uh, organic you know, material. If you go and grab a leaf off of a tree or something, it's going to be bitter. But the bitterness in beer is largely a function of isomerized alpha acids, which is iso-alpha acids. It's just a shortened version of saying that. So uh, that, is, that is a part of our focus today because of this idea of, of removing mid-boil uh, you know, hops mid boil. So now let's let's break down kettle hopping in general. I I actually don't know what newer brewers are being taught. I don't know what you know instructions are coming with their first kits or anything like that. But when I started brewing back in 2003, it was just widely accepted. We've talked about this many times before. Uh, there there was this kind of classic or traditional approach to understanding how kettle hop additions work. If you add hops, you know, at the beginning of the boil and you leave them in there for your 60 minutes or your 90 minute boil, that's a bittering addition. If you add them somewhere in the middle of your boil, you know, uh, 20 to 30 minutes left in the boil or so, that's a flavor addition. Uh, And if you add them later in the boil, about 15 minutes to flame out, that's an aroma addition. Uh, I think obviously that is way too simplistic. We know nowadays that you get more from each one of those additions, but still, at least when I'm talking to people, it seems like that is still a fairly uh, commonly accepted, just general understanding of kettle hopping. I think that that is a, a simple enough to make most styles of beer. I think in the last five years, what has happened is the, I would call it the democratization of the information on hops, which was really a scientific, uh, ad, uh, academic project that has become much more driven by smaller craft brewers that want to understand hops for very hoppy beers. Specifically, the not the bittering additions, something we're not talking about at all, but the, the flavor and stuff. I think this kind of set of breakdown of where things happen is is really just dictated by what you think will happen if you destroy chemical compounds right if you have very very delicate essential oils things that will vaporize something that is if you just go to your bag of hops open the bag you smell something those are very sensitive volatile compounds you can imagine if you heated those up they would just be destroyed yeah so that's why i think people think this way and i don't think it's bad i don't think it's incorrect to start with this but also know that there's way more going on behind the scenes than this. That's, I think, the point. Yeah, you know, the, I, the only one of those three, the whole idea, behind, you know, the, there's early, mid-boil, and then late, or bittering flavor and aroma, uh, relatively, or respectively speaking. Uh, the only one that I question is the whole flavoring addition. Uh, we know that you're going to get aroma. I mean, if you've ever had a Bohemian Pilsner that's that's just receives a single 60-minute, you know, fairly large hop addition of sots or something, uh, it still has aroma and flavor. I mean, so, so this idea that, that by doing one, you're eliminating the other two. No, that's not the case, but, uh, we know for a fact that, you know, if you dry hop, you're going to get flavor and aroma out of that as well. Uh, and it actually imparts a different, 
characteristically different type of bitterness. Uh, so anyways, that is the traditional understanding of kettle hopping. Now, how do we determine bitterness level? We've got to talk about this. I know that a lot of people these days <laughs> yeah. are doing the whole IBU is a myth. It is not a myth. Uh, IBU is just a way of us to organize our understanding of bitterness and, and to hopefully yeah. try to help us predict uh, a level of bitterness that that is consistent, right? And, uh, and there, now there are various equations. I actually don't know the huge difference between all of these occasions. I think the most are equations. I think the most popularly used one is Tinsith. Would you would you agree with that, or are you a I, user of something uh, else? I I think I I think I uh, uh, yeah, I started my my cut my teeth on like Jamil Janechef and all the brew uh, the brew uh, brew network guys. I think he yeah. was a fan of Rager. I think so. If you think about these things, and you can look at images, I believe Beer Smith has an images or a set of images on this. I'm just pulling them up now. Basically, each equation is a way of talking about the bittering at versus time, and there's just different f fitting curves. So first, what is bitterness? Bitterness is very subjective. Someone had to come up with a way of quantifying bitterness so that you could say this is more bitter than this mm -hmm. how do you do that they use a spect photo spectrometer in a lab they take the hop they burn it they do stuff to it and then they look at it. it's how much light goes through it or reflects from it at a certain wavelength that number is ibus so beer dis beer diluted measured ibus ibus is this correlation to bitterness that we have so there's some number and some people say bitterness is only zero to 100 ibus they can only interpret something uh, you can't interpret bitterness more than 100 ibus fine we're not going to debate that today yeah <laughs> with, tin, with with tin seth rager all these formulas are doing is saying okay we have a we have to fit if you put an ounce of hops in for so many minutes how much bitterness is extracted how how, how how much is that bitterness utilized and these just have different s slopes basically versus time because what happens is if you just take the thought experiment just boil for three hours or something like that you're not extracting more bitterness than you did if you boiled an hour the return on investment for boiling is not the same at zero to 15 minutes than it is at like 30 to 40 to 40 to 50 and these are different slopes yeah now what will happen which i guarantee you will happen is if you boil for three hours you have no more wort left yeah, i was gonna which say make, <laughs> yeah. which is so that's so you have to think about that everything else being equal everything else being controlled that's what's going on in the bitterness calculator so what i say is for the people at home thinking about this is pick an equation stick to it if when you make a 30 ibu beer you don't feel like it's 30 IBUs. You think it's 40 IBUs or you think it's 20 IBUs. Try a different equation and see what you think. That's how I would approach the problem. Yeah, it, it is interesting. And, you know, all of these equations take into account the alpha acid of the of the hop that you're using, time, and, you know, the the understanding that you're tossing it into a boil. I mean, it was only recently that I think most of the brewing calculators out there, you know, we're using Brewfather these days, but I was using Beersmith mm -hmm. back in the day. I've used Brewer's Friend. Um, I, it, it wasn't that long ago that I recall them actually changing the, uh, you know, like um, flame out additions to actually adding some level of bitterness as well. And it's just a different mm -hmm. equation. The thing is not, none of them are perfect. I've, um, we've submitted beers and I, I know this isn't a show that's specifically on bitterness, but we've submitted beers to labs to have them tested multiple times. And the tests come back with, with, you know, an IBU. And I put that in podcast quotes here, uh, an IBU that is wildly different than what any of the calculators or the equations in those calculators uh, spit out. So it, you know, you, it really is. I think there's more, it's more important to develop recipes based on your personal preferences and not even have to worry Absolutely. about a number. The, the interesting thing about, I think it's interesting about IBU is that we all use that term to, and I, it, to, to describe like lab measured and expected, you know, equation measured. And it, and I wish we would come up with a different, a different thing, international bittering unit or bitterness unit. Uh, you know, if, if I'm getting it measured in a lab, maybe we could call that actual bitterness, you know, and, and if I'm doing the prediction using Tinsith, Rager, Garrett's or whatever, we call that IBU or something. I don't know, but it is, it is kind of confusing because I think a lot of people in their heads kind of, you know, they settle on, well, this is what, you know, Brewfather told me the IBU is. So that's what it is. I promise you, if you were to submit that and, uh, you know, to a lab, it's not going to come back the same, uh, you know, maybe it will, but largely it likely won't yeah I, I feel like you just need to take 
you, you not even go to a lab and just say, here's my bittering or here's what I believe my hop bitterness is and then go from there because yeah. you're going to get a lot more. And this is something that's going to take time for you to develop. Say you have a hops recipe ho- ho- beer you like to make and it's not bitter enough. Okay, well, you can always add more bittering hops, but then is your calculator really giving you what you want? And I think bitterness, again, these are one of these things, if you really get in the weeds, especially with beer judging, <clears throat> and as I recommend everyone try beer judging at some point because then you talk to someone else critically about a beer, what I'll tell you is you, your perception of the beer will be very different, but you can still agree on certain points, and that's how scores are developed and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, you can be very different on scoring, of course, but you know you need to you need to kind of settle on how you taste versus how, how someone else tastes and go from there. And I think bittering is one aspect of a lar- much larger uh, project with that. So yeah, another interesting thing you, you know you mentioned uh, that that you know whether you people can even perceive bitterness beyond this kind of magical one hundred IBU number. Uh, another thing that's commonly said is that you most people can't distinguish a difference in uh, that that's less than five IBU. So if that's you serve me a 40 IBU beer and then serve me a 45 IBU beer, there's a good chance I'll perceive them as being identical in terms of bitterness. Absolutely. But, you know, at 46, then I'd probably notice it or whatever. So just things to keep in mind when it, when it comes to this idea of removing bittering hops, you know, obviously the standard approach to kettle hopping or to, to, to bittering, you know, wort uh, is to add hops at the start of the boil and then you just leave them in there throughout and, you know, they get left in large part in the tube in your kettle tube uh, when you're when you're done with a boil and racking over to a fermentation vessel. So why I wonder Andy, why would anybody want to remove bittering hops? What would what what's behind yeah. that? Well, I think the first thing we thought of, you know, this is again one of these ideas that some someone has a harebrained idea and then we're like working like, "Oh yeah, this is interesting. Let's think about this more." Is <clears throat> you think today of all these modern hop products that remove all of the um, vegetal matter. We had talked earlier about if you just eat a leaf, you know, there's bitterness in that, right? There's something astringent. So what if you allow the hops to kind of soak for a second and then you ripped them out? Would all the good bitterness, the what we'll call good bitterness in this case, the iso alpha acids, would those stay in solution? They would they would boil, they would isomerize during the boil, adding bitterness while not subjecting the hop green matter to any heat which would minimize vegetal. And I thought this was really cool because like, okay, maybe there is something to this. And then doing a real experiment towards it would prove that the astringency, if there was a difference in the beers, right? Because we're not going to, we can't ask the question, do you taste vegetal matter? We're saying, is there a difference in the beers? Does this have a difference flavored, uh, a a measurable uh, impact from taste and aroma flavor between the two beers, and that was really a question. Yeah, it, it's it, when I think about why somebody would want to do this. There's the there's the proposed uh, reason that 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 uh, Steve told me when he did the experiment when he was when he was coming up with his experiment that he had heard from somebody else, and that's that. Hey, we we don't want you know this this crazy level of bitterness. What we want is to get whatever <laughs> whatever's contributed from a sixty minute you know a uh, uh, hop addition that seems to be lacking or it seems to be missing in hazy IP. Now, let's just be real here. This whole idea came about because of brewers of hazy IPA, which are notably not bitter. But there's people out there who feel like something was missing with doing just, you know, five minute to flame out boil editions uh, of hops. And so they what they were what they were looking for was, do we get something out of that 60 minute edition uh, that that adds this? I don't know how to describe it. It's this ineffable thing that they're saying they feel is, is missing from from hazy IPA. If we remove those, will we will we remove that bitterness as well, or or uh, you know, I guess minimize the the level of bitterness in the beer, but still get this other thing? And I think that is a really interesting idea. It took some mental gymnastics for me to to fully grasp <laughs> what they were talking about, but once I got it, it does kind of make sense. You know, I mean, you think about the fact. I believe it was Matt from Firestone Walker who had mentioned uh, years and years ago on a podcast I was listening to that they he he uses uh, a charge of fuggles at 30 minutes when they're making Union Jack, which to me is like the best easily available IPA out there uh, because he feels like it contributes just something different, this fullness uh, of flavor, of hop flavor, even though it's Fuggles. You know, Fuggles is not known for its for being like a, a really good IPA hop or anything, but 
I feel like you get that as well, whether it's Fuggles or Willamette. I like to include kind of an earthy, basic hop mid-boil when I'm making IPA, and I do feel like it rounds things out. I wonder if that's not what people were kind of after with this idea of, you know, add your hop, your bittering hop charge. You're only going to get ostensibly, this is why we tested it out, but you're only going to get, you know, a limited amount of actual bitterness, but whatever else is contributed could be that thing. It could be that missing link. Yeah. To me, even that beer has a specific mouthfeel and structure. They talk about this. He's talked about Union Jack quite a bit on podcasts, but there's like, you know, especially the older school, older school brewers that talk about IP, they talk about like mouthfeel and structure. What I get from hop, hops uh hoppy beers like hazy ipas is a actually a, a negative bitterness from the load of hops that's added to them late boil yeah. or or from the dry hop it is a astringent bitterness which i you know some people would say tea like or or, or or something like that where it's a it's grating and what i find is those beers because they're not only have that they're served like very fresh because there's uh, usually people put those in four packs of cans they're released one weekend and then they sell out so if you have to get them immediately then they're they're a can the day before they're much better two or three weeks later in the can if the canning line is good right preventing all <laughs> yeah. oxidation all the oxidation possible right if they're dialed in those beers soft often a lot and i think that is i believe that comes from the large additions of vegetal matter to the late edition in dry hop and that has to settle out that's my personal opinion i i think that people talk about hazy ip saying having a soft bitterness and i think they may have a soft hop bitterness but they have a large astringency <laughs> so that's how <laughs> yeah. i i look at it but i'm very sensitive to it and though hey don't get me wrong i like bitter things i like hoppy beers i like tea right i enjoy a glass of tea that has astringency to it but it can be a little too much and in the wrong place in some beers so yeah yeah i'm with you i i far prefer a bitter ipa you know a bitter ipa to the to the softer uh i always call it fluffier you know hazy ipa but i i i get it i've had hazy ipa that i think is perfectly fine it's not like i'm going to order a full pint of it i'd never do that it's just not a style i like that much but uh there is, i do feel like in some examples of hazy ipa there is just something missing and it's not just the bitterness there's something else there. It leaves this weird feeling in my mouth, uh, this flavor that doesn't quite fit. So maybe, you know, maybe adding hops up front and then removing them before all of the alpha acids are isomerized. That would again, that would indicate then that the alpha acids are not just quickly dissolving into the wort and then isomerizing, you know, ab separate from the the hop matter right the leafy matter so that that's interesting the other if that's the case if they are if if the you know if the lupulin immediately goes into the wort and now you've just got you know empty green uh hop leaves just kind of floating around for no reason then that could be a good way to to potentially reduce vegetal flavors off flavor stuff like that who knows uh but it, it was worth experimenting i think uh one thing you know i'm thinking about this in terms of hazy ipa one thing i think anybody trying this method might need you know, might want to consider is uh, what the cohumulone level in those hops are, the CoH levels uh, in those hops are that you're using up front. Because we have shown it's very difficult to do tests, sensory analysis type tests on uh, the impact high cohumulone has because you know you can't use the same exact hop variety. So the the ones that we've done, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a future episode, do seem to indicate that higher CoH hops do impart a sharper bitterness than lower CoH hops. That may be a function of the hop variety itself. It may not be, uh, you know, anything to do with CoH in general, but it is pretty widely accepted that hot, the higher the cohumulone, the sharper that bitterness is going to be. So considering hazy IPA is not sharply bitter at all, you may want to go with something like Simcoe, which is notably low in CoH. Uh, you know, I've never done this before. I'm, th this is one of those things, like a few that we've talked about on this show, that I, I've never even considered doing. Uh, but that doesn't mean I wasn't curious about the impact removing bittering hop additions might have on wort uh, if you're removing those hops mid-boil. We uh, put it to the test. Results from that experiment right after this break. Thank you. 
Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Brewpod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, plus it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. There are quite a few brewing methods I've never tried myself, and removing bittering hops mid-boil is definitely one of those. In fact, when contributor Steve Thanos proposed an experiment to test it out, I initially didn't understand why. <laughs> but after talking it over, it did sort of make sense to me, at least enough to get me on board with the experiment. Yeah, so one way to test the variables in brewlosophy, we always think about what beer we're going to use. Um, and in this case, we picked Kolsch. And you know, we just spent spent 20 minutes telling you about why hazy IPAs have an uh, interesting kind of bitterness and why do we pick Kolsch. <laughs> yeah. We really wanted a beer that would exemplify the variable without being buried in other variables, right? Right. Beer is a very complicated beverage. A lot of things are going on simultaneously, not only in the beer, but the drinker that's enjoying the beer, right? So by picking a style that has, you know, it has a firm bitterness to it, but it's not overbearing and it's not conflated by other late additions or other flavors. We just wanted to let the bitterness shine and that would might be lost in hazy IPA. Yeah, and, and caveat, I mean, we have to admit, right, that maybe this method would have a different, uh, would, would, would work differently in a hazy IPA. That's always uh, a possibility. Uh, but we went with Kolsch because it is simple and it will allow any differences caused by the variable to shine through. So that is why uh, Steve went with a Kolsch. His grain bill, very, very simple. 90% Pilsner malt, 10% Munich malt. That sounds like a good Kolsch recipe to me. Yep. So very simple grain bill. And let's go through the brew day. So bring process, single infusion mash. Both mashes started at 152 Fahrenheit or 67 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes. When the mashes were complete, <clears throat> he removed the grains and brought the warts to a boil. Here's where the variable comes in. Uh, he added 14 grams of magnum at 12% alpha acid to each wort at the start of the boil using a hop spider, you know, stainless steel metal hop spider. Um, 30 minutes in, remove the hops from one of the worts. So that's when the variable begins. And then each batch was hit with another 14 gram charge of magnum at five uh, minutes left in the boil. That stayed in the wort. After the boil, the worts were chilled and equal volumes of worts were racked to identical fermenters. So measuring the uh, OGs, hops that remained in the boil, the beer that had hops throughout the boil was 1058, and then the hops removed mid-boil at 1055. So that's interesting to me. I mean, already we're seeing an objective difference. Now, three mm -hmm. specific gravity points is really not that big of a deal, uh, but the fact that these were made identically by the same brewer using the exact same methods except for uh, the removing hops mid-boil in one of them, and that one ended up being 1055, it makes you wonder, right? It's either there's some level of uh, sugar or whatever you know being imparted by the hops, though it was only half an ounce, 14 grams, uh, or, or there's something else going on. Maybe the hop matter being present in uh, that wort for longer, for 30 minutes longer, just somehow uh, contributed to a higher OG. I don't know. I think it's interesting at the very least. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a measure. It's a, it's a number. Um, I, I don't know if it has a. I think there's maybe other um, things going on because it doesn't make sense that it would be sugar, if, especially if only added that much raw sugar. It wouldn't. I don't think it would impact the uh, OG that much. But it's a variable we have to record it just so that when we finish the experiment, you know how much of a difference in OG it is if it affects the finishing gravity. Yeah, so. yeah. So I, I I agree. I mean, we want to keep track of all of these things, and the fact that there's already a three point difference uh, in OG is just pretty interesting. So, well, he took those worts, he put them in fermenters, uh, same exact fermenters, you know, identical fermenters, uh, placed those in his fermentation chamber, and then he pitched a wonderful yeast, Imperial Yeast Geo Three Dieter. That's the PJ Fra strain, uh, which if you haven't had that coal, she got to it's so good. Uh, and then he fermented these beers at 64 degrees Fahrenheit or eight. 18 degrees Celsius for three weeks before taking hydrometer measurements showing that the beers were both at 1007 FG. So now, now you've got one that starts at 1058, goes down to 1007. The other one starts at 1055, goes down to 1007. So, you know, maybe that's just where that Dieter just kind of putts out is, is around 1007, yeah. you know, specific gravity. But either way, uh, one of the, you know, when you've got a starting gravity difference uh, and a similar FG, one thing that you have to keep in mind now is that there's an alcohol difference as well. The the ABV is different between these beers. Yeah. And so just have that in your back of your head if we, you know, as we think about the results of this experiment, would that have an impact or not? So uh, some objective observations of the beer post-fermentation. Uh, if you look at the beer where the hops remain throughout the boil, it's a little paler but closer inspection, it seems to be a function of the lighting. So we talked to Steve. Steve confirmed this. Uh, otherwise, it has a hazy golden color with white foam. So picture perfect otherwise. Well, I, I, I you know, Kolsch is supposed to be clear. Uh, I, I don't know why this beer stayed hazy the way that it did. Uh, Steve and I talked a little bit about it, but, you know, after the fact. And, and he was just like, yeah, I'm stumped. It could be that he was using some craft malt for this. I, mm. believe he, I believe he was using craft malt, which sometimes, you know, I've had experiences where even with gelatin fining or biofine, you just cannot drop a beer clear. So I, I'm not entirely sure or why this beer stayed hazy. If you go look at the photo, though, on, on, on this experiment article, it does look like, like the beer on the right is maybe a little bit darker. Steve confirmed that his lighting was just off on that, on that and that the beers mm -hmm. looked identical, and I, I take his word for it. So uh, just for those who are going to go click the link, which you know we include in the description of this episode, uh, and, and look at it, and you're like, wait a minute, these are clearly different. He, he confirmed that they looked identical to his eyes. I mean, yeah, this could be a pro function of protein, not doing a protein rest. There's other things that are going on with, right, that, with right. that little haziness. So so personal impression for Steve, he did five triangle tests, uh, and he chose correctly every time. <laughs> uh, the beer that had bittering hops removed mid-boil was perceptibly sweeter, while the beer with the hops remained throughout the boil was properly bitter, making it crisper and more enjoyable to drink. I think this is very interesting. This, before we even talk about the experiment results. So if you, you know, I remember back when we started Brewlosophy, one of our things was we didn't want to be just another you know, anecdotal brewing blog. We, we, we wanted to provide actual taster data and you can make of it what you will. But this to me is fascinating. The fact that Steve was able to distinguish these beers consistently and easily uh, and that he did perceive the beer that had the hops removed as being sweeter, which would seem to indicate, at least based on Steve's anecdote, would seem to indicate that those alpha acids stuck to, <laughs> as it were, stuck to the vegetal matter and that they, the isomerization somehow stopped when those hops were removed. That has some really interesting implications to me. And it's also just fascinating that it worked. I was not expecting this. I fully expected these beers to be, you know, Steve, Steve to taste them and not be able to tell them apart at all. Uh, even knowing what happened, I I'm with you. I just think that is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I think this goes to, you know, when we do experiments, at least my thinking about this is that, you know, every taster is unique and we could have variables that are, are, are relatively objective for a certain person, right? There is a measurable difference versus the ensemble. The ensemble is going to measure things differently, right? So it's like having different rulers for a measurement, right? Some people are more precise. Some people are more accurate, you know, all these different things. So what we want is a general, we want to try consensus, but we show you all the data. So just one data point. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. That And that one data point that, I, you know, we as much as we trust Steve, uh, we, of course, want to get more data points uh, in, the way that, in the way that we do. So Steve ended up serving these beers to 20 participants who took the triangle test. Uh, again, just a re quick reiteration, triangle test, that's three beers, two are identical, one is different, and the participant's job is to pick out the one that's different. Out of those 20, 11 people needed to identify the unique sample in order for us to say with some level of confidence that there was 
was a reliable, you know, a reliably distinguishable difference here between these beers. In the end, how many people actually were able to pick the odd beer out? So the actual results on the people that could taste it was 15, which is a significant result. 15. That is 75% of tasters. Uh, again, uh, people c- get confused with the triangle test. It's pretty simple. If you've got three identical beers in front of you and you serve it to, to 33 people, you'd expect about 11 people to pick each one just out of randomness, right? Uh, when, when, somebody, w- when a group of people end up selecting one of those more, uh, to a certain degree more uh, than that expectation of 33%, that is when we start to push into significant zone. And in this one, it was quite a bit above that threshold, you know, out of 20, you need 11, 15 people identified the unique sample that left only five people who got it wrong. And that's going to happen. Uh, so that does seem to indicate that this process, this weird method of removing bittering hops or removing hops, as it were, halfway through the boil did lead to a or did have, we should say, a perceptible impact on the on the on the beer, on the characteristic of that beer. And that is really interesting. Uh, you know, again, and, and, it, and the fact that it jibes with Steve's experience even more so, uh, I, I don't, I'm, you know, did it have this special quality that people feel is missing in hazy IPA that doesn't receive a bittering addition? We can't really say, but what we can say is that removing those hops did, did seem to reduce the bitterness. Again, we did not measure that piece of it. That's based on the anecdotal reports of tasters as well as Steve, uh, but it did have a perceptible impact on the beer, and that's fascinating. Now, when we get a significant result, we do ask tasters, those tasters who were right on the triangle test, uh, a preference question. Basically, we have them compare just the two beers that are different and pick the one that they like the most. Four people out of the 15 who got it right preferred the beer where the hops remained in the wort throughout the boil. Steve considers himself among that group. Uh, nine people, holy moly, uh, like the version where the hops were removed mid boil. So they liked the less, the ostensibly less bitter version of this Kolsch, which I think is interesting because I think I'd probably like the more bitter one, but I'm old school. Uh, one person had no preference despite perceiving a difference, and one person admitted that they didn't really re- perceive much of a difference between the beers. Really interesting results there. Yeah, this is really cool, actually, because so something I do in work a lot is we try to do experiments that have uh, a, po- a clear positive or negative result, right? We run an experiment. You want to know you learned something or didn't learn something. The worst thing is a null result, yeah. Where you learn you learn nothing. So you try to design your experiments to avoid null results as much as possible. Right? You have a direction to head down. So let's just go back a second. If this result had been not significant, we would start to think or you know start to believe that hey everything ends up in the beer. Removing the hops leaves you with a bitterness and nothing else. But it also would make you question. Wait. Is our hops adding the vegetal bitterness? Yeah, yeah. Because now we removed them, so wait, shouldn't they taste them? So now we have a new answer. We did significance, which means there was a difference flavor-wise, taste. You know, subjectively, people could taste a difference. So that could mean two things. One is the bitterness, the hop bitterness, or the vegetal matter. Now, like we said, we could run IBU, like quantitative IBU analysis, and say, oh yeah, this one has this much more hop bitterness than that. And that would actually help us build better calculators, right? That would tell us something about how to run calculators better. We can make the Thanos uh, calculator now based on this data, right? <laughs> that also helps me think, hey, we have a perceived difference. Maybe that's vegetal matter, maybe not. And that's where you'd have to get into some different type of panel analysis that we don't do, which is like a quantitative flavor analysis and right. trying to do spider spider diagrams and stuff, which would be very interesting. And that's a t- place to take this data. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see that this was significant because that does tell us something interesting about hop bitterness. Well, and what it does in, in many ways, uh, you know, let, let's just hang up the whole hazy IPA thing and the reason this method even came up in the first place in, in our conversations. What it does is it confirms the existing idea that we've been taught that that there that bitterness is a function of contact time in boiling wort. Uh, that the longer that's in there, it does, it, it, it seems to confirm again, no, we didn't ask anybody if it was more bitter or less bitter. That That is purely what Steve said he experienced and what uh, people he talked to after taking the triangle test uh, reported back to him. But I think we I think we can safely assume that the, the beer where the hops were removed was less bitter than the one where they weren't. Uh, again, that is just an assumption, but I just think that's interesting. All we really can say is that removing hops mid-boil, at least from a Kolsch, does seem to result in a beer that's perceptibly different than one where the hops stayed in the wort. And based on Steve's assessment, again, 
that that difference does seem to be in terms of sweetness and or bitterness. Uh, this doesn't really tell us much at all about whether adding hops up front, uh, then removing them early contributes anything special to beer. But but I think we need to design an experiment around that with a hazy IPA. Okay, we've determined that this this process has some impact. Now let's test it out in a real world setting uh, in the style that people are are you know thinking of uh, when this when this method comes up. And I think we might be able to find something really interesting there. It's going to take mm-hmm. some. It's going to take some design thought there. I think we have to brainstorm yeah. uh, some some ways to approach it. But I do think it'd be uh, definitely worth testing out at this point uh, to see if you do get that fill in of whatever's missing in, in hazy IPA that people seem to think is missing at the very least. Absolutely. Well, we've got some reader comments I'd like to get to real quick. Uh, first one comes from Bents, who says, wouldn't removing the hops after 30 minutes be equivalent to adding them at 30 minutes into the boil? Uh, interesting thought, Bents. Uh, boiling the hops for half the time means less extraction and less IBU in the finished product, making it sweeter slash maltier. Also, at that point, why not just adjust the starting water amount in the grain bill then only boil for 30 minutes where hops are actually present? If I may, Bents, I think the idea with uh, removing mid-boil hops was that there's something special contributed with that 60-minute boil uh, or uh, with those hops being in, in present for 60 minutes. Uh, and, and you have to kind of think about it in terms of this special thing and then separately, there's bitterness. They don't want bitterness. They want this special thing. And the idea or the proposed idea here was that by adding hops at 60 minutes and then removing them halfway through gives you that special thing without imparting as much bitterness. And these results kind of tickle that idea. They, they kind of confirm on some level that that may be happening. Yeah, it's... It, it. I, I see where they're coming from, you know, oh, just only boil for 30 minutes. And I think what you have to say is, again, this is a complicated chemical process. And we wanted to look at one specific thing, which was this 30 versus 60 versus quote unquote 60. It is, it makes sense. Oh, just boil for 30 minutes. That leads to other things going on in the beer that we don't fully understand, in my opinion. Right. We're just trying to focus on one thing that, I mean, old school brewers, you know, they, they, they live by the 60 minute, the 30 minute, the 15, the 10. We're trying to kind of turn that on its head a little bit and say, is this really important or not? Or what is this doing? And how do we... Uh, maybe capitalize on the knowledge we just learned. Yeah, and in particular, when it comes to brewing hazy IPA. I mean, I think we have to keep yes. that in mind with this. I can't think of another reason you'd want to do this. Uh, I, you know, it, <laughs> And that again, that could just be because I'm so welded to classic styles and liking the bitterness that I'm getting uh, by using these more traditional approaches to, to kettle hopping. So next comment comes from Daniel, who says, honestly, this really surprised me. You and me both, Daniel. I thought the hop oils were extracted rather quickly and keeping the vegetal matter itself in there would be largely irrelevant, except maybe uh, for the extraction of more vegetal slash grassy aromas. I'm quite surprised the bitterness was actually reduced. Uh, Daniel, just a heads up. We, I've already said it, but just to say it again, we don't have objective proof that the bitterness was reduced. We have anecdotal reports that the bitterness was reduced. And I, and I accept that as likely true, but just, just to get that, just to be clear on that. Yeah, it's true. Like again, we're just saying that the holistic analysis of the beer, because our best tool, the toolkit that we live on, experiment is whole beer analysis and statistical student t-tests modified student t-tests however you want to talk about it that we've done this for we've done this since the beginning of brewlosophy basically right yeah so we don't have a gas chromatograph quad quad mass pull spec uh, <laughs> you know we don't have the fancy tools right but there is something about how we approach the problem and what you learn from it right yeah we're not here to sell the beer at a certain ibu spec or dump it because it's not meeting true to type brand at a brewery, right? We're not a brewery making money. We're trying to give you information to think about your beard a little bit differently. And that's what this is, right? So if this makes you think, well, it affects bitterness, then that's what you've interpreted. I think it's more like use this as a springboard, like any experiment, use this as a springboard into your own brewing processes to what you think. And you might not develop an experiment around it. You know, we we do encourage you to do blind triangle testing and stuff like that to help you understand your beer better. But however you take the information is, and however you spin it to use it in your brewery, that's what you're allowed to do and we encourage that so absolutely absolutely uh final comment comes from eric branchad who says it would have been great to see ibu measurements on this one i'm curious whether the added bitterness is due to more alpha acids being extracted and isomerized or whether the ibus are close enough where the difference may be from tannin and or some other compounds extracted from the vegetal matter of the hops very cool thought experiment and even cooler that you were able to see it through 
Yeah, exactly what I would do if we had the if you know if we had the you know it's again it's budget it's money it's it's time it's 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 also did we think about that before publishing right <laughs> that would be the one way to know about it right and I do I do believe I I would have to take this data and say look there is I would say I I would bet if we measured the IBUs there is a difference in IBU I think it's closer than you think. And I think really it's the vegetal matter that contributed it. Now I'll have to come up with an experiment that could prove that, but you know, that's, that's for me to think about after we turn off the podcast. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I agree with Eric that, that I would have, I mean, of course we would love to see IBU measurements on any hop related, you know, uh, 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 experiment that we do. Unfortunately, that is just unreasonable for us, you know, garage scientists who are trying to provide some level of, of curiosity of you know, satiation. Uh, but it would have been interesting. And at this point, you know, w- the way, that this experiment turned out we just have to trust the palates uh of steve and the people that he talked to after the fact who all seem to agree that the 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 beer where the hops were removed was less bitter that is just so interesting to me because like daniel said earlier i I would fully have assumed that all of that lupulin would have just separated from the hop material and still continue to isomerize but it didn't seem to i mean that that is just so interesting so i'm glad steve did this experiment and i look forward to seeing you know what we can come up with to test continue testing this idea out uh, again in in a hazy IP I think would be the most appropriate so well dude that is all we've got on removing mi- uh, bittering hops mid boil is there anything else you'd like to add no I think this was a good experiment I think the only thing I would say is if you take anything from this you know t- sometimes you want to do a beer you want to change things a little bit look at it through a different lens and I think this is an experiment that does that um, so just take that for what it is Maybe try something like this in your own brewery um, and play around with it and let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe to the Brew Lab podcast where host Cade Job takes you into the lab with real brewing scientists to discuss the fascinating research they've done on our favorite beverage. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through.